Well, here I am again uh, to give you further information on the Whispering Gallery Mode Biosensor history. And this time I wanted to talk about the sizing of single nanoparticles. That work started in 2003. My name is Steve Arnold. I'm from the Microparticle Photophysics Laboratory at NYU Polytechnic School of Engineering in Brooklyn. The logo for the laboratory uh, is the Chinese symbol for light inside of a dielectric sphere with whispering gallery waves moving around the outside. Most of the work that we've done has been driven by theory. And for this particular case, um, uh, the theory is sort of fun to tell you about. It all occurred when I began to wonder whether, in fact, we could detect single particles. I looked as hard as I could for information about this and couldn't find it. So I began to do a thought experiment. The thought experiment had to do with um, imagining in space a cylinder with a piston at the end and photons, a number n, rattling back and forth. As these photons rattle back and forth, uh, they will put pressure on the piston and it will begin to move. That system will then do work. So any work done by that system has to lose energy from the photons inside the cavity. And if I preserve the number of photons, which is called adiabatic invariance, then I have a very simple statement. The work done is the change in the photon energy. Well, you can see basically that since the number of photons is not going to change and H is not going to change, the change in the frequency will be in proportion to the work done. It's a kind of nice result. So I began to go back to the idea of whispering gallery mode a microcavity and wondered what would happen when a particle reaches the surface of that cavity. And uh, what does it do? And the answer is that, well, based on the work of Arthur Ashkin, we expect that, in fact, if a particle gets into a gradient of intensity, it will climb the gradient, be pulled to a surface. So writing down Ashkin's equation. I imagined uh, that the photons in the interior, which were held by total internal reflection, generate an evanescent field about 200 nanometers in, in length, and that that field, which decays exponentially, can draw the particle in through its gradient forces. So now it's just a matter of going back to this fundamental idea and basically writing it out. On this basis, the work done in drawing the uh, particle to the surface, and by the, this RS I mean it's the position to the center of the particle, is going to be equal to just the integral of this, and that's a particularly simple thing to integrate. All you end up getting is the polarization energy of the particle. So this really nice result it says that basically the photon energy inside the cavity, the photonic energy, its change is equivalent to the polarization energy of the particle when it gets to the surface. Well, I had a, a little a twinge at that point. I had a problem. Namely, I didn't really expect this to be uh, dependent on the number of photons. So I thought, uh, how am I going to get rid of that? Because I don't think that is important. So I divided then by the number of photons in the cavity by essentially dividing by the energy. On one side I put it in terms of the quantum energy and on the other side I put it in terms of classical energy including both the electric and magnetic fields. And then the magic begins. N and H disappear and we get the frequency shift as a fraction. And it's the fraction of the polarization energy divided by the energy in the cavity. This is now known as a reactive sensing principle. And the question really is, what does it predict? Well, uh, in uh, 2003, when I wrote this paper, I, I imagined that maybe a protein, which is very, very small, or a, a virus, which is also fairly small, moves to the surface of the cavity. And I wrote down that the wavelength shift would be um, the negative of the frequency shift in fraction and that this would be equal to the result that, that I just showed on the last slide. 
I worked out the electromagnetics on this, and basically it was saying that the wavelength shift would be proportional to the volume of the particle, which means I could size a particle if I could measure this wavelength shift. I imagined that the particles were moved to the equator, which gives the largest shift. And then I also um, imagined a, a factor here which had to do with basically the exponential decay of the intensity at the surface. So th this is the characteristic evanescent length, and this is basically the radius of the particle. For protein, this is essentially one, and I took it to be one in that, in that article. But as things get larger, it turns out the, the amount of field at the center of the particle will be smaller than that at the surface, and this factor will go, go below one. Most important, I found that uh, it had a really distinct dependence on the size of the cavity. So that if I can make the cavity size smaller, I should be able to increase the shift above the noise. And for one particle, I estimated in particular an HIV particle in a silica microspherical cavities, that if I reduce the size of the cavity down to 40 microns before diffraction takes over and try to t begins to cost us sensitivity, and if I do this at 780 nanometers, then according to my theory, I could basically detect a tenth of an HIV virus. In other words, the prescription is very simple, 40 micrometer radius, 780 nanometers or below. And then the question is, uh, how do we do the experiment? Well, we do it by looking at a frequency shift of that sphere, and this is the typical setup developed in our laboratory. You power up a distributed feedback laser by changing the current through it that then scans its wavelength. As it scans, it reveals a dip. When a particle hits the surface, the dip shifts. Then the reason I bring this up now, and it was in the, la the last history of YouTube, is in fact that it's available now from a company called mp3laser.com. I have one in my lab, and it's a great device. Well, let's see what we found. We started the work on influenza virus. The work was uh, done by uh, Frank Vollmer doing experiments. I did theory, and David Kang participated in both. And he set up, namely Frank set up this wonderful microfluidic cell, this very, very simple thing, um, very elegant. And immediately upon lowering the radius to uh, 40, micrometers, he began to see steps in the wavelength shift. Th this revealed that single viruses were hitting the surface. But do we have a size spectrometer, which would be the greatest thing, right, in solution? And the answer is, uh, yeah, I mean, in some sense we do, because if, when I looked at the influenza, I inverted the reactive sensing principle. I got a size for it based on a fractional shift of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 8. That size was 47 nanometers. And in fact, SEM had shown that the size of influenza varied from 45 to 55 because of the variable protein coat. So in fact, this appears to be incredibly successful. But how about other sizes? Well, uh, around the world, did, people did experiments at 13, 12 nanometers, at 10, 60 nanometers, at 763 nanometers, at 652. Um, they recorded uh, wavelength shifts. I translated those back into size. Uh, at the very smaller sizes, I was able to essentially turn that G factor into one because the field at the center of the particle and that at the surface were practically the same. But as the sizes became larger, above um, about 100 nanometers, I began to have to use um, a G factor which was basically exponential because the evanescent field is exponential, namely e to the minus a over L. I could still work analytically with that. And so uh, you can see the comparison between the hydrosol sizes which were known or sizes through SEM and in fact, uh, what was um, inverted. 45 degrees would be perfect, and as you can see, it's nearly perfect. So right now, influenza 
can be determined. HIV can be determined. Polio is harder, but work done at Caltech in Carrie Valhalla's group indicates that you can measure things this small rather easily. And then MS2, which is the smallest virus which attacks uh, bacteria, is also possible. If you stay tuned, I'm going to um, begin to think about um, uh, single molecule detection in the next YouTube. But meanwhile, please visit our uh, laboratory webpage where you can request papers. I see more and more of you coming into the field, for which I'm, I'm delighted. And so for now, bye-bye.